Good morning. Welcome to Berean Baptist Church on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. We're glad that you've uh, tuned in and watching us through uh, the live stream uh, on the internet. If you were tuned in just a little while ago, you heard a tremendous message by our assistant pastor, Brother Aaron. Uh, I tell you, it was great. And if you missed it, you can hear it a little bit later on on the, on the YouTube, and we'd like for you to do that. But we're glad you're with us this morning. We're, we're still missing congregating together, but uh, we have been praying for each other. I know you've been praying for us. You've been praying for the church and <clears throat> for me and, and Betty and all of our, our people. I have one announcement this morning before we look into the Word of God. Most of you probably already have heard through the medium of Facebook, but there may be some of our people who have not heard, and that is uh, one of our former members, Brother Phil Croy. He was here at the church for several years and was a, a good help to me for a, a many years. He passed away uh, on a Friday. Uh, he'd been sick for several uh, months, and we want to be much in prayer this morning for uh, Sister Pat and the family. It's going to be hard on her, and she's going to miss him, no doubt, but we certainly want to remember them in prayer and ask God to comfort them in times like these. Let's go to the Word of God. If you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 this morning, and before we look into God's Word, let's have a word of prayer this morning. <clears throat> Father, we come to the throne of grace, and we are thankful that we can be in thy word this morning. We thank you for that which we've already heard, the true message from the word of God. And now, Father, we pray that we uh, will open our hearts and receive uh, the message that God's laid upon my heart for God's people. And I pray, Father, this morning for our people. Uh, we do pray for uh, Sister Pat during this time. We do pray for several of our members as Brother Aaron prayed for. We, we pray for uh, Sister Bonnie and Brother Gail. We pray for Brother Dawn and, and uh, um, Marion. We pray for uh, others of our church family, Brother Cook, and uh, during, he's going through some troubles uh, with his heart. And others, Father, this morning, uh, you know who they are. You know what the need is. And we ask you, Father, to meet that need according to thy will. We pray especially for Brother Milo and Cindy. Uh, we were able to see them Thursday, and Lord, we do pray that you'll strengthen him and comfort him and bless him. And now bless this service, and bless those that are listening in by the internet. God, we pray that you'll speak to them from thy word this morning, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to share with you a few words this morning, uh, several, uh, not very long scripture, but we're going to... I have two or three. Matthew chapter 16, in beginning with verse uh, 15, Jesus asked his disciples a question. He says here, He saith unto them, But who say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now I want you to notice what Jesus says here in verse 18. And I say unto thee, unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to notice where he says to Peter, uh, upon this rock I will build my church. Let me clarify something here. Uh, he's not talking about Peter being the rock. He's talking about himself. Uh, Brother Aaron brought a, a message last week, tremendous, on the rock. And uh, Jesus did not build his church on a man. Jesus built his church on himself. He's the rock. But with that in mind, turn over, if you will, to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 5, and uh, we find in chapter 5, 
uh, verse 25, beginning with verse 25, these words. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, Husbands, love your wives, but notice, love them even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that, thou might, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He's talking about the church that he himself founded. He says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. But no, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even, look, he's using the church, even as the Lord, the church, even as the Lord, the church. Now, we're going to land, if you've got your Bibles, over in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Uh, you can turn back, if you will, Acts, chapter 2, beginning with verse 41, Acts 2, 41. And the Bible says, And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and uh, parted them to all men as every man hath need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. <clears throat> I know most of you listening in this morning are very familiar with this passage of Scripture that I just read here in the book of Acts. But you find here in these verses that we have the biblical example of the kind of church that the Lord Jesus Christ himself founded and where the Bible says he loved it and gave himself for it. Uh, he, we have here in these verses, the kind of church God wants his church to be, I believe uh, there. You see, the church is not just a physical organization. The church is a spiritual organism. Having been founded by Christ himself, empowered by the Holy Spirit, composed of born-again baptized believers. It has Christ as its head, the Word of God, which is the old King James Bible as its authority, the Holy Spirit as its power, and pastors and teachers as the spiritual leaders, and composed of born-again baptized believers. A true New Testament church, the members of that church, should be born again, regenerated people who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior there. And the Bible says they were assembled together in the congregation. They had one message. What was that message? It was Jesus Christ and him crucified, shedding his blood on the uh, cross of Calvary for the sin of the world. That's our message. We, uh, Paul says, I saved and owned nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The New Testament church has the message of Jesus as the only way of salvation. And then it has one mission. Jesus gave it, the mission to them in Matthew chapter 28. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. So I want to submit to you this morning your most glorious and most wonderful institution on earth is 
the New Testament church. Founded by the Lord Jesus Christ, if you please, and I believe every born-again Christian ought to count it a privilege and a blessing to be a member of a New Testament, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. And yet, dear ones, as pastor down through the years, so many so-called Christians seem to take the church so lightly. They seem to have no conviction about putting everything under the sun before the church. It doesn't seem to bother many Christians to miss service after service and yet they claim to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say on the authority of God's word, you cannot love Christ as you ought to love him if you do not love the church that he gave his life for. Amen. I want you to get that uh, there. In Hebrews chapter 10, we've got that famous verse where Paul writes, uh, uh, there, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some are. We're going to get back and touch on that in just a moment uh, there. But listen, when one deliberately, intentionally forsakes the assembling of themselves together with God's people, I want to say to you, that is disobedience to God's word. Just plain and simple. And may I remind you this morning that the Bible says disobedience is sin, whether you believe it or not. Hebrews, you find that in Hebrews chapter 2, 1, 1 and 2 on it. And yet, as I said, so many so-called Christians, they tell me they love God. They tell me that uh, they've been born again. They tell me that they've been saved, but they feel no conviction whatsoever about missing church uh, there. And I've even had some of them say to me, well, preacher, what's so important that I attend church? And especially, why should I have to go to church three times a week uh, on it there? Well, I want to preach this morning on the subject, what do you miss when you miss church? I believe this is important. I believe God's people need to hear it. I sometimes preach a message like this. I go walk out the door, and we've got a pretty good congregation. And I've had people say, well, preacher, you ought to say that to those who are not here. Well, you're not here this morning, but maybe you're listening in. And so I want to say it to you, those who are listening in. Maybe, maybe God will use this message to speak to your heart and show you the importance of, of, that, that God himself puts upon God's people assembling themselves together in a local Bible preaching New Testament church, amen, uh, on it there. If I believe if people realized what, how serious it is, I, they don't realize that, how important it is that they support and assemble themselves together in God's house with God's people. That God wants, that's why God established the church. I'll say it a, a little bit later on. But Jesus did not establish his church for him. Jesus established his church for us. You, you, may, you may not need the church, you say, but the church needs you. Amen. Uh, on it. So I want to use this example. You got your Bibles here in the book of Acts, and, it, and there's some other scriptures I'm going to be turning to in a few moments to share with you what I believe the Bible teaches that we miss when we miss church. I, I, I appreciate uh, we being on the Internet. I appreciate those of you who are listening in this morning. But I want to tell you something. This is no substitute for the assembling in God's house, on God's day, with God's people. It's not, it's, not, it's, it's not a substitute. 
It's not, listen to me this morning, it's not the same thing as if I were up here facing you and looking at you and, and preaching to you in person. I thank God we can do it. But I tell you, by, by uh, the Bible standard, we ought to be assembling in God's house this morning. Amen. But what do you miss? What do you miss when you miss church? Well, I'm going to share with you what I believe the Bible says, four things that we miss when we miss church. Acts chapter 2, the first thing you miss when you miss church is the sweet fellowship of God's people. May I say that again? Because I want you to get it. The first thing that we miss when we miss church is the sweet fellowship of God's people. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, if you got your Bibles. And it says, and they continued steadfastly, not spasmodically, not when company didn't come, not when, the, when it rained too hard, not when you had something else to do. The Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread. Now look at verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Oh, listen this morning. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing more sweeter on earth than the wonderful fellowship that you find among God's people when they meet together in God's house. I mean that with all my heart uh, on it there. Uh, <clears throat> one of the distinguishing marks of this early church, the first church, was the fact that they uh, that there was fellowship among the members on it there. Now, this word fellowship is an unusual word. It's translated from a Greek word, uh, which is called koinia. Koinia. And what does that mean? Well, you can go look it up if you want to. But it simply means this. It means to be like-minded, having the same interest, and what it says here in verse 46, it means being of one accord. Let me say something to you this morning. When you're in sweet fellowship with each other, you're in, you're in one accord with each other uh, on it there. Now, fellowship involves, I'm going to show you something. Fellowship involves three things. We talk about having fellowship. I'm not talking about drinking coffee and eating donuts and, and uh, having ice cream. That's, that's, that's one type of fellowship, but that's, that's not the fellowship the Bible talks of. The, uh, the Bible mentions there are three things that must be if you are in sweet fellowship one with another. First of all, it involves relationship. Now get this, if you will. Uh, again, look at verse 41. Uh, look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, I want you to notice, number one, these were born again, baptized believers uh, therein, uh, you see. Uh, what are you getting at, uh, preacher? Simply this. The basis for true fellowship, and if you're to have fellowship one with another, you first of all must have fellowship with God. Uh, oh, uh, there. You see, their, their fellowship was based on the fact that they had received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They had followed the Lord in believer's baptism. And by that, they had become members of that first New Testament church. And, and the result of that was they had sweet fellowship one with another. 
You to have our fellowship with each other is based on our relationship to God. I really hope you get that uh, because I'm going to show you uh, where I'm getting at. If you got your Bibles, turn to First John chapter one. I want to show you something. Your your fellowship with your brother and sister in Christ is based first of all upon your relationship to Almighty God. In John chapter 1, let's just read it from God's Word, John chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. If you're going to have fellowship, the right kind of fellowship, with your brother and sister in Christ, look what he says. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This is, verse 5, this then is a message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now look at verse 6. Here we go. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Let me say to you this morning, unsaved, unregenerated people cannot have fellowship, a uh, uh, real spiritual fellowship uh, with other Christians because they're out of fellowship with God. Uh, there, look what it says. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, if you walk in the light, you, you know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Oh, listen. When a Christian, hear me now, or a so-called Christian, but I even believe a, a born-again Christian, when a Christian is out of fellowship with their brother or sister in Christ, it's almost always, I found this true down through the years of my ministry, when one is out of fellowship with their brother, they usually are out of fellowship with God. You see there uh, on it. And I say to you this morning, you heard some hard preaching from Brother Aaron. I, uh, and I, what I'm going to say is probably uh, a little tough. But I, I, it has bothered me over the years as pastor, 60-some years, preaching the Word of God uh, there. And for the life of me, I cannot understand how a person confessed to be saved and sat home in front of a TV on Sunday night when they know the church is in service and they have no conviction about it. I want to God someday, somehow, somebody will explain to me how that can happen because I don't believe it can uh, on it. You see, John says here, my fellowship with my brother and sister in Christ is a relationship between my fellowship and me and Almighty God. So fellowship involves relationship. But let's go back to Acts. Notice something else. Fellowship involves companionship. Look what it says. Verse 45. And uh, let's look at verse 44 and 45. And it says here, and all and all, not some, not part, and all that believed were together. They were together in one place and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now, <clears throat> a lot of folk have problems with that scripture. And I say, oh, that, that must be communism. No, that was, they weren't talking about that. Don't you know what, what it means? It means that, let's, let's just let's dissect it. He says, he says they all believed 
were together. They all had the same purpose. They all were in unity. They all within well, had one accord, one with another. And it's talking about taking care of the brothers and sisters in the church. I believe this morning God's people have an obligation who are members of a local church to take care of those members that have need in that church, the church is to come to the aid of that need, whatever it is. On it there. Uh, in it. So notice what it says. Well, I like this word. All that believed were together. That's important. Paul writes in, in the church of Corinth, for we are laborers together with God. You see, the work and the ministry of the New Testament church, uh, I hope some of our church members are listening. It requires that everyone cooperate with each other and that we work together in one accord and unity for the cause of Jesus Christ, and then we'll have fellowship one with another. Amen. I often tell our church, they, uh, they're... Uh, Listen, this, this is not a one-man operation. Never The Bible doesn't teach that. The pastor is the spiritual leader, yes. God is the heavenly leader, yes. But this is God's work, and all throughout the Bible, they accomplished together what God wanted them to accomplish together on it on it i just said it again we must work together in unity in one accord with one purpose if we're to be the kind of church jesus wants us to be amen not only does fellowship require relationship or dependent upon companionship but notice something else involved in fellowship it's worship Worship. Look at verse 46 and 47. Boy, I like this. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. <laughs> they, they weren't scattered all over the country. In the temple and breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now look what they were doing. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord then added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were assembled together in the temple, praising and worshiping God. Now, I've had people say this to me, and I'm sure Brother Aaron has and others. Uh, <clears throat> I can go out and visit and knock on doors and you invite them to church. Oh, I, they say, I can worship God without attending church. You hear me and you hear me well this morning. No, you can't. Why? Because the Bible teaches that worship is always associated with the assembling together go back to the old testament where brother aaron uses quite a bit you find that in the old testament god always had a pacific time and a pacific place where they were to assemble in order to have relationship with god god always designated a place for his people to assemble. And I say again, you hear me this morning, you cannot have fellowship with God if you are disobedient to his word and if you will not assemble yourself together as God said we are to, then you're disobedient to God and disobedience cannot have fellowship with God. When you miss church, you miss the sweet fellowship but with, with the Lord 
and with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It may not bother you to miss that, but I want to tell you this morning, it bothers me. Again, I'm glad we can do this through the internet, but I whole lot would rather be together with God's people this morning in God's house. Amen. But let's notice something else, what you miss when you miss church. Now, you're getting it over the internet, but but I think you'll understand what I said. You got it this morning. I'll show you what I mean. Because the Bible says, when you miss church, you not only miss sweet fellowship with God's people, but you, you miss the strong preaching of God's word. <laughs> we got that this morning, didn't we? <laughs> but let me say to you this morning, the New Testament church was built on hard Bible preaching. In fact, over in the book of Acts, uh, uh, chapter uh, uh, 4, it was hard preaching that got them in trouble in the first place. Let's just see what God says. Acts, chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. And as they spake unto the people, they were, they were preaching, speaking unto the people, and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now look what they came up on them for. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even time. But look at the result in verse 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men, didn't say anything how many about the ladies, maybe young people, but it says the number of the men was about 5,000. I say to you again, it was the hard preaching of God's word that brought the first persecution upon the early Christians. They, they, those of, the, of that day, just like it is today right now, the world does not want to hear hard preaching. Amen. They just do not want to hear it uh, there. Now, what were they preaching? It all said there. Verse 2, they are preaching the same message that God has given us to preach today. What was it? They were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus. A resurrection from the dead on it. You see, they were preaching what we pre preached last Sunday on Easter Sunday. They were preaching the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what and they knew what they they knew what they were preaching. They were preaching hallelujah this morning. That because of the death, the burial, and Jesus Christ, He and He alone is the only way to salvation. And they that crowd didn't want to hear that. That offended them on it. I'm telling you this morning, it's hard preaching, calling people to repentance and, 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 and getting them by faith to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard preaching we need today. Can I have a, I wish I could get an amen <laughs> on it there. Uh, there. Well, what does hard preaching do? I'll give you three things hard preaching does. As again, I, I, I was I, I appreciate that message this morning. Uh, but hard preaching, do, the, uh, this is why the world doesn't like hard preaching. I'm going to show you in God's Word. First of all, hard preaching exposes sin. We need to return in our pulpits a strong preaching. Listen to me this morning. A strong preaching against the wickedness of sin. We need to cry out against this moral depravity and the filthy degeneracy that has permeated our society. Somebody needs to sound the alarm. Somebody needs to cry out that sin is still sin in the eyes of God, no matter what man calls it. Amen. 
We need to call sexual perversion what God calls it. And God says, you hear me this morning, it's an abomination in the eyes of Almighty God. Sin is sin. And no matter how much you try to sugarcoat it, no matter how much you try to change it, no matter how much you try to cover it up, what God calls sin is still sin in the eyes of God. Sin will expose, or, or hard preaching will expose sin. We've got too much preaching around sin. Kind of touching the edges of it, you know. But never getting down to the heart of what sin is and how loathsome sin is. Let me tell you this morning, it's because of sin that sent Jesus Christ to the cross. Uh, and again, they, hard pre they don't like hard preaching. I know that. I know that. Some, like Brother Aaron said this morning, Probably some have already turned us off. But that's okay. Doesn't make any difference. Sin is still sin. And, and hard preaching will, will name sin and expose sin and call sin for what it is. Ah. Uh. Well, let me, I could, I, I, I could get in trouble here. <laughs> no, I could get in real trouble uh, on it there. But <clears throat> I think you, I think those, are, you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. We're in, we're in a day when they, when we've got this uh, political correctness garbage and it is garbage. Well, you can't preach against this, and you can't preach against that, and you can't call this sin, and you can't say that is sin, because it's hate speech, and hate speech will get you thrown in prison. Yes, it will. It will. But that doesn't change it, does it? Amen? Amen. <laughs> Sodomy is still a sin in the eyes of God. Amen. Abortion. The slaughter of untold thousands of babies. I'm telling you this morning, that's an abomination in God's sight. That's a, that's a sin against God to kill unborn babies. Sin needs to be exposed. Our pulpits are not exposing sin. They're sugarcoating sin. And brother, sin is real. And sin will send you to hell. Amen. Hard preaching not only exposes sin, but what is Hard preaching do. Hard preaching exalts the Savior. Hard preaching exalts Jesus. Acts chapter 2, verse, uh, let me go back here a minute. Verse 32 through 33. It, it says, This Jesus hath God raised up, all, uh, whereas we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. Listen, our preaching, not only should we preach against sin, but we ought to exalt the Savior who died for that sin. We, Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Oh, listen. What I'm saying is we need to point men to Jesus. Amen. Point men to him. Let's go back again, if you will. Look at uh, Acts chapter uh, uh, 4 and verse 12. Hear the word of God. Here's what it says. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name. I don't care who it is. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Oh, listen. Any message that does not exalt Christ and point men to the 
Uh, he, he who was lifted up on that cross. It's, it's not a message that will accomplish anything. You go back again. Did you read what it said uh, in, in verse 4 of chapter 4? It says, and the number of them that were saved or believed was about 5,000. Man, I would have liked to have been in that revival meeting. Amen. I'm telling you something. Hear me now. The only message that will result in the salvation of souls and men getting saved, the only name that can do that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, our, pre our hard preaching needs to exalt him. Exalt him. Not the preacher. Amen. Not the church. But him. Him. And thirdly, hard preaching will exhort the saints. You find that over in 2 Timothy. I'm not going to take time to go over there, but listen to me. Good, hard, sound, solid preaching will stir and motivate God's people to do what they're supposed to do. Someone said this. Hard preaching will do one of two things. I think it was mentioned again this morning. It will either drive them away or it will draw them near. Jesus, in John, uh, the Gospel of John, preached his crowd away. The Bible says that while he was preaching, that many of his disciples turned and walked no more with him. And the reason was this. The Bible says, they said unto Jesus, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? They were saying to Jesus, what you're preaching is too hard. We don't want to hear it. Amen. We don't have, we, we, hey, we can go down, we go down the street to a, 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 one of these churches that just get, make us feel good. Yeah, you can. And a lot do. But that's not what you need. You need the hard preaching from God's word. And I'll say amen. Thank you, Brother Cowardin. That's pretty good. Amen. Uh, on it there. You see, when you miss church, especially when you come to Berean Baptist, you miss hard preaching. Amen. We, we, don't, we don't tell stories here. We don't try to uh, muddle cuddle around the, uh, the bush. Sometimes it makes me wonder, why do, why do people come to church? What do they want? Hey, I had somebody tell me the other day uh, about, about our church. I don't feel comfortable there. You tell me in God's word where it says you're to be comfortable for co in coming to God's house. Who in the world told you to, that coming to church you ought to be comfortable? Listen, coming to church, you ought to be stirred up and challenged and encouraged to go out and do something for our God. Amen. When you miss church, you miss hard preaching. Number three, quickly. When you miss church, you will miss spiritual singing. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's in the Bible. I'm glad you asked. Turn with me to Ephesians. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of Christians don't realize this stuff's in the book. Ephesians chapter 5, if you will. <clears throat> let, me, let me point out a scripture here. Ephesians 5, verse 19 and 20. I'm talking about when you miss church, you miss good old-fashioned spiritual singing. Here's what it says. Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, 
singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Woo! Look what's, look what's associated with this singing. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if that's not enough, turn with me on over to Colossians. Just a few, few pages over. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Listen to this. Listen to this, church. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. I tell you this morning, I like preaching on the internet. I'm glad that we had it. I have it. I thank God for it. But I miss the old time singing we have when the church is gathered together. Amen. We've got one of the greatest song leaders in this entire area, Brother Harry Willicks. And brother, when he gets ready to bellow it out, you will sing to the top of your voice and you'll praise God and have that joy in your heart because of your singing unto God. Amen. Oh, listen this morning. There's nothing, nothing like hearing the people of God raising their voices in song, in praise unto God. I just say to you this morning, again, probably get some turned off here, but there is no substitute for the old songs of Zion that has been handed to us down through the years. <laughs> uh, uh, that's why we here at Berea, not ashamed of it, we still sing from the hymn book. Amen. Why, preacher? Because the old songs have a spiritual message behind them. The old songs... Touch the heart and not the head. Oh, listen. This modern nightclub beat that you hear in many churches where they repeat one verse seven times or, or seven verses 11 times or whatever it is, I want to tell you something. Uh, that, that kind of stuff does not touch the heart. Oh, it may stir you because it satisfies the flesh but I want some songs that will speak to me and my heart this morning. Now, you can get all that fleshly music on the uh, TV and radio and even the new internet if you want. But in church, Amen. you need some songs that glorify and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. On this rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Oh, those old hymns. There, that's what. Listen, you can preach when you at one day when the church gets done with good old fashioned uh, spiritual singing, brother. You can get behind the pulpit and preach because your heart has been stirred. Amen. Oh, that's what you miss when you miss church. No wonder so many of our Christians are going or dragging around and look like that they uh, can drink milk out of a, I don't know, a barrel or something. No joy in their heart. I'll tell you something. I, I know, I know, I've done it. I've never gone. I hope I've never gotten that low, but I've come, you know, I've, I've come to church kind of well, kind of not really. But brother, when when we when you get through with singing those hymns, you're stirred up, and it'll do something for you. That's what you miss. But I've got to close. Thing is, I can preach as long as I want to here. <laughs> you can turn me off. <laughs> but let me give you the last point. What do you miss when you miss church? You miss 
scriptural teaching which is essential for spiritual growth. Amen. Acts 28, got your Bibles? Let's go back. Listen to this. I'm talking about now scriptural teaching. Acts 28, verse 30 and 31. It says, and Paul dwelt two, two whole years in his own, own hired house, he was in jail, he was, he was under house arrest, his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him. Now look what he did. Preaching the kingdom of God and, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Let me say something this morning. The Bible certainly puts a lot of emphasis on preaching. But did you know the Bible puts more emphasis on teaching Amen. than it does preaching? You go, you, go, you go count it and count it. The Bible says, listen to this. The Bible says more about Jesus teaching than it does about Jesus preaching. It sure does. You can count it uh, there uh, on it uh, there. You see, it's through the teaching. It's through the teaching of God's word that Christians grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we have Bible school. That's why we've got, we got, like you used to call it, Sunday school is okay. I like Bible school. That's why we have it. Why? Because in Bible school, or even we have it on Wednesday night, Bible teaching, that is where it is through the teaching of God's Word that we learn what the Bible says. What do you learn? Well, we learn what we are to believe. <laughs> That's doctrine, 1 John 3, 23. We learn how to behave. That's living. 1 Timothy 3.15. And then we learn what to beware of. That's Colossians 2.8. False teachers. False doctrine. How do you know what's false? How do you know what's right and wrong? How do you know what to do and not do? You know because you know from teaching what this book says and then you obey it. Amen. That's how you know. That's how you know. On it there. On it. Paul, I, I, we over, Brother Aaron and I overlap some. Paul writes in 2 uh, uh, Timothy 2.15, Show thyself approved unto God. But how? By studying the Word of God. Studying the Word of God. On it. You see, three things, and I'm, going to, I'm done. The Word of God is milk for your soul. 1 Peter 2, 2. A young Christian, a baby Christian, they need, to be, they need to start out on the basics. They need to start out like a baby does with milk. You don't cram the whole Bible down a new Christian's throat. You don't expect a new Christian to fall right in line and do everything that you think he ought to do or she ought to do. You nurture them. You bottle feed them. You bring them along. Because, why? Because the, uh, the uh, Bible says that the Word of God is milk. You can read it. I, I've got, but not only is it milk for your soul, but it's bread for your substance. 2 Corinthians 9, 10. You can read. The, it, 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 it is bread, the, mel, the bread of God's Word that strengthens us and... and uh, we, we get, uh, we finally get to what the third thing is. The, the Word of God is, the, is meat for our strength. Milk, bread, and meat. In Hebrews chapter 5, that was again, I believe, was quoted this morning. Paul admonishes those Christians because of one thing. They had not grown spiritually he said you're still babies you should be 
You should be mature. You should be on strong meat. You should be eating T-bone and New York strip. And, and man, you should be gaining strength, but you're still babies. And let me say this in closing. That is what's wrong with most of our Baptist churches. About 95% of them are still babies when they ought to be on strong meat. They're on milk when they ought to be on meat. And why are they on milk and not on meat? Because they have not digested the teaching of God's Word. Amen. Again, for the life of me, what would it take for you to be in Bible class on Sunday morning? You'd have to get up an hour early. Well, if you go to bed an hour early, it wouldn't bother you. Amen. Folks, no wonder we're anemic spiritually. Amen. Anemic. We haven't fed on the word of God, which is the word of life. And therefore, we're like a little bunch of whining, crying, whimpering babies. Most pastors, thank God, I can honestly say, I wish you were here looking you in the face. I don't have to do this at Berea. Well, there are some I'd like to. But basically, I don't have to do this. But I've got a lot of pastor friends that have to go around Pampering, babying, patting their members because they're still babies and they're not on the meat of God's Word. Folks, you miss a lot when you miss church. Amen. You miss fellowship with each other. You miss, you, miss, you miss strong preaching that will correct you. You miss spiritual singing that will lift you. And you miss scriptural teaching that will grow you. Amen. I don't understand. Oh, I do, but I don't understand how a Christian that says he loves God can have peace when he misses church. Because I'm closing with this. Church is not in front of that TV. I'm glad, we, I'm glad there's some good preachers on there for the shut-ins. But church is not in front of that TV. Church is not listening to some preacher on the radio. That's not church. Church is assembling yourself together in God's house for one purpose, in one accord, Amen. to worship and praise God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. This was not a really an evangelistic message. But sometimes God's people just need to be reminded. Church is important, folks. It is not a second child. It is not to be, if you think, you know, just when you want to be, no. If Jesus Christ loved it enough to die for it, we ought to love it enough to live for it. If you're listening to me this morning and you're not a Christian, I'm sure you didn't get much out of this. But if you come to know that Christ is your Savior and you really get saved, You'll be where God wants you to be on the Lord's day that's at His house. If you do not know Christ, I invite you this morning to bow with me. Ask the Lord Jesus to come into your heart and save you. Maybe you're a Christian, honest and saved, born again, baptized, but you are not faithful to the local church. You need to examine yourself seriously. You need to look into your heart and see what, what is it 
that's keeping me from putting my priorities on the Lord's day to be God's house. Maybe this morning you'd ask the Lord to forgive you of your unfaithfulness and your undedication. I don't know. I just know that the church is, a, is a founded by Christ. He's, he's, he founded it. He started it. It didn't start at Pentecost. It's already in, in, in existence now. He founded it. He started it. And most of all this morning, He died for it. Father, I pray that You take this message not preached in anger, but preached in concern. Preach, Father, in burden that we, if we would just come back <laughs> supporting the church, the church could do so much more. God, I thank You for those that do support the church. I thank You for those who are faithful. And God, we praise You for them. We couldn't do it without them. I know God doesn't really need us, but we need You. And Father, I pray this morning for our church, our people. I thank You, Lord, that they have put up with me as pastor. I thank You for that. I don't deserve that, but I thank You for it. And God, I ask You to bless every member of our church this morning. Speak to their hearts. Help them to understand how important it is and what they really, really miss when they miss church. Help us to have a good day today. Be back in the Lord's house tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Amen.